ثانك يو مستر ايرمان حقيقه قبل ما ابدا المحاضره بتاعتي برضو انا بدوري يعني انا حاسس بمنتهى الفخر صراحه ان استاذي الكبير الدكتور عادل بيه يعني قيمه وقامه كبيره للعظام في مصر ووزير الصحه الاسبق ورئيس الجمعيه السابق انه يعني يبقى يقدمني يبقى عارفني شخصيا دي حاجه انا اعتز بيها جدا وطبعا انا مش هستغنى عن ملاحظات اساتذتنا والمحاضره ديت طبعا احنا كلنا عايزين نتعلم فيها شويه حاجات هيبقى هدفنا في الاخر ان احنا نهايلايت الكونسبت ودايما يا جماعه في العظم الواحد لما يجي يتعلم اتعلم فرق بين كلمتين كبار جدا حاجه برنسبل وحاجه اسمها فلسفي يعني في مبادئ المبادئ دي لا تتجزا لازم كلنا نتفق عليها بعد كده في طرق مختلفه لتنفيذ الخطط العلاج الهدف في الاخر ان احنا نبقى متفقين عن مبادئ عشان الاتفاق على المبادئ بيسهل لنا كتير جدا المانجمنت اوف ذيس كيس. سو ماي توك ويل فوكس اون بري بروستاتيك فراكشرز سبيشلي ان توتال هيبر بليسمنت. اي ام عبد الله حماد وركينج از اسيستنت بروفيسور ان الكسندريا يونيفرستي هوسبيتال. تو ستارت ويز وي هاف ذيس كيس بريزنتد تو اس ا ميتال اون ميتال ارتيكيليشن Uh, in 35 years old male patient and uh, this articulation was serving very well for uh, about 10 years and then uh, after trivial trauma uh, you can see that the supporting bone at the bed of the femoral stem is uh, fractured and now uh, our uh, mission today is uh, to diagnose and classify this fracture and to know basically when you can only fix the fracture and when you are forced to replace the uh, hip implants and uh, thirdly we should highlight uh, the importance of some uh, pre-operative planning uh, key points we should know that uh, periprosthetic fracture is really a very challenging and very important problem Why? Because we know that the number of primary and revision hip uh, procedures are increasing worldwide. So it is logic to have increased rates of complications. And as Dr. Adel Adawi already uh, mentioned, uh, one of the most uh, uh, common and most uh, bad outcomes of this uh, total hip replacement is the fracture of the supporting bone. Also, another contributing factor is that we know that the life expectancy of our population is uh, coming uh, longer, and uh, we know the risk of uh, fracture is higher with uh, older age, so we uh, are expecting to face more of these problems in the coming decades. Uh, as uh, published by Australian Joint Registry in 2014, they estimated that uh, there are Uh, about, about 10% rate for uh, periprosthetic fractures in all primary uh, total hip replacement, and this rate could be doubled in revision to 20%. And of course, femur is more uh, common fractured uh, than the acetabulum. So uh, we will start to focus on the femur, and for the femur, we have, uh, according to the timing of the occurrence of the fracture, We have the what's called intraoperative or early postoperative periprosthetic fracture, which occur in uh, about um, even in uh, during surgery or about uh, six weeks to eight weeks after surgery. And uh, the contributing factors for the occurrence of these uh, fractures are related to some patient factors, uh, mainly the poor bone quality, which is. Uh, Uh, very evident in advanced age in female uh, populations, especially if there is osteoporosis and in rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Second important issue related to the patient also, if there is a stiffness of the hip, 
which may be associated with difficult uh, dislocation, and this may cause fracture uh, of the femur due to rotational forces. This is uh, usually could happen in post-automatic osteoarthritis in cases of protrusio estabili or enclosing spondylitis. The third cause could be a difficult anatomy when the proximal femur is deformed as a sequelae of neglected developmental dysplasia of the hip. And uh, the most important uh, patient factor is the presence of a previous surgery in the affected hip, whether this surgery was osteotomy, failed uh, osteosynthesis, or most frequently a revision hip scenario. We are surgeons can uh, do some technical uh, problems that uh, may lead to increased risk of these fractures. So if we utilize minimally invasive surgery in uh, uh, those patients with poor bone quality, we are increasing the risk of uh, fractures. If you are using cementless implants, especially if you do some technical errors like aggressive rasping of the uh, femoral canal or uh, maldirected rasping leading to cortical perforation. And most of these uh, issues could be uh, prevented or minimized by uh, uh, very accurate and uh, uh, detailed preoperative planning. So, in a sense, most of these uh, factors are avoidable if we are doing good preoperative planning. On the other hand, the late postoperative fracture is a sequelae of what the implant is doing to uh, the bone. Uh, it could be associated with low energy trauma, but most frequently, even without trauma, if the uh, particulate debris leads to osteolysis and wear and continuous removal of the uh, bone bed, especially proximally around the femoral stem, this will lead eventually to loose implant and then this move within the bone and leading to stress rising and fracture. So the combination of these uh, three factors together with the uh, mentioned factors before uh, about poor bone quality are the main contributors for late post-operative fractures. How to diagnose this fracture? Uh, you start classically with the history taking. So as we mentioned, trauma could be a cause. You should ask about trauma in every case. What is the mode and the cause of that trauma? Also, you should ask about history of thigh pain, especially with weight bearing, or start up pains in the morning, which denotes the starting loosening of the implant. And also, you should ask about wound healing problems, because if this loosening is septic, and it may present also by a, a, a fracture. So, a combination of infection and the fracture is the worst case scenario. Included in the history, you should have a clear image about the patient you are going to treat. Usually you are dealing with fragile patients, so you should know about uh, the use of their walking aids, about their cognitive ability, what are their demands, what are their comorbidities, whether these comorbidities are controlled or not controlled. And in examination, you should take a general examination, uh, the orientation of the patient, and uh, the cooperation of the patient, and you should uh, 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 examine the neurovascular status. You should know whether this patient is bedridden or was moving before the fracture, and you should examine for uh, deformation of the lower limb. X-ray is the main stay for diagnosing a periprosthetic fracture. And as uh, you may know, logically, we will uh, see the location of the fracture, the displacement, and the type and configuration of the fracture, whether the fracture is the fracture is comminuted, extended from the metaphysis to diaphysis, or uh, taking a long segment of the uh, femur. What is very important to highlight in this uh, presentation is uh, after fracture, your primary rule is to know whether the implant is loose or not. Because simply, if the implant is loose, as we will see in a minute, you should replace this implant 
together with treatment of the fracture. But if the implant is stable, you will only treat the fracture. So the classic teaching of uh, how to know, lose uh, implant is to uh, examine the serial X-rays for uh, progressive lucent lines, whether there is, change, there is a change in the position of the stem, usually virus malalignment, and whether there is any uh, fracture of the component itself or the cement mantle. Another uh, signs for loosening, which denotes possible implant loosening, loosening, not definite implant loosening, the sign which is called the distal sign. What is the distal sign? This is the bony bridge at the distal end of the stem. This uh, distal end uh, uh, of the stem is supported by this bridging of bone because the stem is moving, like the base of uh, a statue. So if you see this bony bridge, this means this stem is subsiding or moving. Or if you see some irregularities at the surface of the stem, means that the coating of this cemental stem is starting to debond from the stem and denoting that this stem is loose, what's called bead shedding. Again, the most important sign of loosening is the change in the position of the stem. This is the case that we started with. This is the uh, component before the fracture, and this is the component after the fracture. You can see if you take a horizontal line from the uh, highest point of the greater trochanter, that this stem is in their small alignment. Also, the stem, uh, distal part, is moving from being facing the medial cortex to uh, the lateral uh, cortex. So this stem is loose. Differential diagnosis is very important to exclude infection, aseptic loosening without fracture, or pathological fractures. Your preoperative workup should include ruling out of infection, as we mentioned. You should get the previous surgical reports as much as you can, entailing the previous surgical approach, the previous attempt to treat the uh, fracture or history of previous uh, revisions, the medical comorbidities, and should be prepared for the worst case scenario. And then you will individualize the treatment based on Vancouver classification. All of this is very important, but what is the most important is that you should prepare your patient for a long surgery. So you have a fragile patient, you stabilize the patient first because there is no place for hit and run surgery in these situations. Treatment is based mainly in the femur in Vancouver classification. Vancouver classification has three main types, type A, type B, and type C. Type A is fracture of a bony process which is not involving the bed of the stem. So A stands for apophysis, okay? Type B involving the bed of the stem. So B is the bed of the stem. And type C is clear. C, clear from the stem. Now type B is subdivided into three types. B1, B2, and B3 based on bone quality and the stability of the stem. So in B1, we have a good bone stock and a stable stem, so we'll treat the fracture only. In B2, we have a good bone stock, but a loose stem, so we should replace the stem. In B3, we have both poor bone quality, poor bone stock, and loose implant, so we should replace the stem, and we should reconstruct or replace the bony defect. So again, the decision is dependent on these three factors, implant stability, fracture location in relation to the stem, and the bone stock. Note that Vancouver classification does not entail the timing of the fracture, whether it is intra, early, or late post-operative. The fracture uh, type and configuration and is not, not does not take in consideration other fracture patterns as we will see in a
another uh, classification at the end of this talk. In type uh, A, which is apophysis fracture, you should ask yourself two questions. Question number one, how important is the attached soft tissue to the function of the adjacent joint replacement? So if you have avulsion of the greater uh, uh, trochanter, whether this avulsion will affect the stability of your uh, hip implant or not, this is very important, okay? And second, you should know whether the uh, fracture is displaced or not, okay? The treatment is mainly non-operative treatment, but if the fracture is displaced, you should go for operative treatment, mainly by tension band wiring of the greater trochanter in acute fractures, but in late post of fractures, this is usually a result of osteolysis, as we said, and the treatment is directed to the treatment. Whatever your treatment method, you should avoid fluid bearing and active hip abduction. In uh, 2014, Cabello et al. added two fracture types to the proximal fractures, which is called type A1 and A2. And these fractures are related to the fracture of the medial calcar of the implant. And there are, these fractures have uh, some risk of uh, propagation of the fracture leading to implant subsidence and loosening. And these fractures are more dangerous than simple avulsion. And these fractures, we tend to treat them operatively even if the stem if, is not loose. Some authors, fix all these fractures and some authors fix if the stem is loose only, but uh, the trend now is to fix all these fractures. In type B1, we said that the bone is good, the implant is stable, so the treatment is to fix the fracture by spanning the whole femur, usually by a combination of locked plates and cables. To preserve the bone, is more important than to reduce the bone. So uh, biology here is more important than anatomy. Uh, but be aware, you should assess the stability of your implant very well by history taking, the operative X-ray examination, even by CT and MRI. And the most important is the intraoperative examination of the stability of the implant. Because if the implant is unstable, now it's stable implant, you fix only. But if the implant is unstable, now we are in B2. And in B2, the goals are to restore the long term implant stability and to allow fracture healing. Now we have the problem in the implant and in the bone. What to do? We should replace the stem by a long stem with distal fixation. Usually, cementless options are uh, more valuable than cemented options because the cement could go through the fracture lines, prevent fracture healing. So in this case, the same case, we proved that the implant is unstable. And because this was metal on metal articulation, we opt for long cementless locked stem with cables to restore the proximal bone stock and ceramic on ceramic bearing. But please be aware that in Vancouver, the P2, when you uh, uh, faced with the fracture, you want to replace uh, some of the uh, bed of the implant by a long stem cement implant, this implant could be straight or curved implant, and what is very important is to avoid new fracture. So you should accurately analyze your femur, and you should choose whether you go through the fracture to remove the old implant or you do osteotomy, transfemoral approach, and you should have very accurate preoperative templating to uh, 
put the stem accurately in the axis of the femur. This book is very important if you want to uh, dig in and put cemental stems, long stems. And this book, you will read that there are two primary parameters to examine in the radiology of the femur. First of all is the femur curvature. And if there is any defect size here, the comminution of the structure. So we have either stem femurs, their smell alignment or remodeling, valgus remodeling, and in a, a lateral view, we have increased femoral bound. So if we go with the direction of the old stem, we will cause a new fracture. What to do? Also, we have difficulties, also secondary problems in cement removal, and especially if the patient is osteoporotic. And please don't start reaming, and you don't see where is your reaming going down, because reamers cannot make a curved femur straight, especially when reamers are uh, for a long distance. So in some situations, you may even need to do some osteotomies in the median lateral cortex to get the straight axis of the femur. And if you are choosing to go through the upper end of the femur, what's called endofemoral, not transfemoral, you should not go through the old track of the stem by preparation of the lateral and posterior part of the greater trochanter in order to catch the right direction. الكتاب ده موجود وتقدر تنزله من بنك المعرفه المصري وانا احب انوه ان ده مشروع فعلا عظيم وكل البيبرز اللي احد بيحتاجها دلوقتي هي موجوده فول تكست عليه. In type B3 we have the same problem loose implants but we have also bad bone stock. So we do the same concept as type B2 but we should replace the poor bone stock by either grafting or tumor prosthesis. In very difficult cases, we may opt for what's called resection arthroplasty. In type C, this is uh, an easy type because you can treat it as isolated fracture because the fracture is well below the stem. This case is from Dr. Meher uh, Bihalawa, type C fracture and was treated by a plate and cables. Cables are very helpful and is, as we said before, is more important and better than unicortical screws. A very small notes about periprosthetic fracture of the acetabulum. It is the same concept. You should know whether your cup is stable or not. You should know whether you have good bone stock especially in, uh, when you're doing cementless acetabular uh, fixation, and when the fracture happened again, and whether the fracture happened during implantation or removal of a cup in a revision situation. For this, you will use what's called a prosthetic classification for periodic acetabular fractures. So in this case, this case is, uh, is a case of our department, I uh, uh, did this case of difficult uh, primary hip due to uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip. I tried to put the cup in the anatomic center, but the cup was not well covered, so I created what's called medial perforation of the acetabulum. But you now notice that the posterior column is practically shattered here. We examined the cup and we get the CR and then we decided that this uh, cup is stable and the fracture is minimally displaced and so we uh, tell the patient to go for non wet bearing for at least three months and close follow up of the patient every three weeks by x-ray even by CT scan and the fracture started to heal and the patient now is As we said, Vancouver classification entails three types in femur. A, apophyseal, B, at the bed of the implant, and C, clear of the implant. Now, the uh, unified classification system by Faris Haddad 
has been developed for uh, more uh, improvement of and understanding of periprosthetic fractures with more inter and intra observer agreement. And this unified classification system is suitable for all fractures in all anatomic parts of the body, not only for the head. And they added three other types, D, E, and F. So type D is dividing a bone between two implants, so interprosthetic, so between a hip and knee implant. Type E means that there is a fracture, for example, in the femur and the acetabulum, so we have two bones supporting one arthroplasty. And the rarest type is fracture on a native acetabulum facing uh, any arthroplasty. So this is type D from the literature, interprosthetic fracture. This is type E. You have fracture in the acetabulum and in the distal femur. And we were lucky to see type F in our department. This patient is 47 years, had this bipolar him after for five years, and then a new road traffic accident and came with this uh, medialized uh, hip arthroplasty. And this was treated by the uh, concept of building discontinuity. So we did the bacterial cord doing the mesh and impaction grafting and put a cemented dual mobility uh, cup. Again, as we said, it is not only for the hip. So this is the competition case, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Hamid, is a good name, uh, they were faced by supracondylar fracture of the femur. So it is uh, within the bed of the implant during the insertion of the actual femoral component. And then they rapidly removed the component of the cement. They revealed a three-part fracture of the condyle. The only available plate here was this short reconstruction plate. So uh, I know that we all learn from our uh, this uh, our difficult situations, and I know they managed well uh, to reduce the fracture. But I think they agreed that this plate is too short. As we mentioned, we should span the whole the whole uh, femur. Okay. But now, uh, uh, this patient should be kept in very close follow-up. Why? Because this is another case from Dr. Mayer Halawa. The same concept, but uh, the short blade does not work, and the patient went into non-union, and they uh, had to go for another revision, and this revision by double blading to span the whole fracture area, and eventually it went into healing. Our take-home message, Prevention is better than cure, so you should uh, do gentle preparation to avoid acute interoperative fractures. You should monitor the loose implants very closely, and you should do early revision for these loose implants. Best time to check interoperative fractures or loose implant is actually interoperative, so don't be in a hurry. And postoperative fractures should assist the implant stability and bone quality. This is maybe the last chance for your patient, so preoperative and cannot be overemphasized, and this is not a and run surgery, and this is my reference for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for this highly illustrative lecture about periprosthetic femoral fractures after total hip arthroplasty, and as you have said, there is most the most common fractures uh, we can face whether it is intraoperative or postoperative either in the immediate uh, postoperative period after that i think uh, we agree well, all of us agree that uh, the bone quality and the surgical skill and uh, all the precautions should be uh, put in our mind while practicing the total hip arthroplasty or joint replacement in general and uh, uh, the algorithm of, of management of periprosthetic fractures it depends mainly whether it is intraoperative or postoperative. Intraoperative, we should go directly for internal fixation of the fracture using the suitable implant uh, uh, after occurrence of the fracture. Uh, and uh, in the postoperative periprosthetic fractures, we should decide uh, whether the, the, the prosthesis is stable or unstable 
If it is stable, we can go directly to fix the fracture. And if it is unstable, we should go directly for revision. All the principles should be put in consideration while doing a revision, total hip arthroplasty, and presence of uh, periprosthetic uh, fractures. Uh, about total hip arthroplasty, Dr. Abdullah with us. Dr. Abdullah Hamad, Ma'ana. هو في السؤال بيقول انا معاك يا بيه اتفضل سمعنا يا دكتور عبد الله عشان الاسئله اللي جايه اه سامع حضرتك سامع حضرتك كويس تمام في اول سؤال بيتكلم على ال one of the most important issues that predispose the patients after hip arthroplasty to periprosthetic fractures اللي هو البون كواليتي او if the patient is suffering from osteoporosis بيسال بيقول Uh, if there is any role of bisphosphonates or to uh, to prevent periprosthetic fractures uh, in uh, after hip arthroplasty, we saw the guy in the Iraq. Uh, so, uh, 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 Um, um, now um, we know that uh, bisphosphonate is the, used for um, uh, more than two decades for uh, prophylactic and uh, prophylactic treatment of osteoporosis. But in the last five to seven years, there was increased uh, concern uh, by uh, occurrence of what's called atypical uh, femoral uh, fractures, and these atypical femoral fractures has uh, certain uh, diagnostic criteria. And mainly these fractures are related to decreased uh, bone uh, remodeling uh, because of the uh, inhibition of the uh, osteoclastic uh, activity. Uh, it was not uh, proven until uh, very late in uh, last year, 2019, that these atypical fractures could even also occur uh, around a prosthesis, which is uh, a hip uh, implant. And it started by reporting in GBGS, uh, BGG, uh, with the British uh, Journal of uh, uh, BGG, British Journal, uh, formerly GBGS British. It was reported that uh, 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 an 81 years old lady with a bilateral hip uh, replacement, stable replacement, equally with long term treatment, of the can take femoral uh, fracture. And then, They uh, published uh, on 16 cases and calling for changing uh, the diagnostic criteria for atypical fractures to be included also that these atypical fractures could happen in periprosthetic fracture. However, in a recent meta-analysis, uh, they gathered the uh, evidence and uh, they uh, come to the conclusion that uh, bisphosphonate is useful in mid-term uh, prophylaxis of uh, periprosthetic fractures. So my uh, clear message is that don't use this bisphosphonate for, for very long time. This long time could be about five years. You can use it for one or two, two years, but don't use it for a long time. And the key solution is that the correction of the bone quality in general using business because there is a lot of trials, a lot of papers have been published in the last 10 years, for example, of the, on the use of business to uh, uh, prevent the periprosthetic fractures and even periprosthetic loosening. But uh, as you have mentioned, Dr. Abdullah, uh, a lot of uh, cases have been met uh, suffering from uh, the frozen bone uh, disease or the... Uh, the uh, uh, fracture that occur in the immediate subtrochanteric region with the long-term use of bisphosphonates. I agree with you 100%. But anyhow, we agree that a correction of the bone quality and treatment of osteoporosis is mandatory to prevent periprosthetic fractures and even in prevention of periprosthetic uh, losing. Another question for you uh, that uh, from Dr. Baha Khorna, uh, what is the effect of cable, using cable, on the, the blood supply, the bone blood supply, our periosteal blood supply uh, 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 in inducing uh, bone necrosis after using the cable or even the circular wiring uh, from cable. What is your answer regarding the effect of cable on the periosteal blood supply? Okay. Um, um, I can uh, answer this question uh, by uh, 
going back to the literature in the injury, uh, you have um, a paper uh, about the effect of uh, percutaneous uh, femoral uh, surplus wires on the blood supply of the femur, and they concluded that the location and the number of the cables is not related uh, to significant disruption of the femoral uh, blood supply, although uh, um, they uh, uh, showed that some of the uh, perforators of the superficial femoral uh, artery and, and the profunda femoris has been disrupted by uh, this uh, blood supply. And uh, they explained this, that the femur has some compensatory mechanism for regaining the blood supply. Normally, if you strip uh, as any fracture surgery, if you strip as minimum as you can to insert your circulatory wire and put it uh, abiperiosteal, not subperiosteal, or you put it subperiosteal, but in a very uh, limited uh, dissection, uh, more safe to put it subperiosteal to avoid vascular injury. But if you see, you can put it without strangulation of the uh, periosteum, and uh, you uh, uh, limit uh, the use of this circulatory wire in the proximal part and use the screws in the distal part. Uh, I think uh, there is no good um, uh, evidence against using uh, these cables, and I, I think we can agree that this is the standard uh, treatment uh, for periprosthetic uh, fractures to regain what's called the rotation uh, stability of the uh, femur, and we have a very long-term uh, uh, follow-up series in the literature without uh, mentioning this particular uh, complication. So I can say that this could be a theoretical uh, point, but it is not proven clinically. Another question, I don't, it is not related directly to the topic of your lecture, but so Dr. Hamza, Muhammad Hamza, on the revision surgery, is it useful to use a spacer in revision due to infection? في البوست اوبريتيف انفكشن او انفكتد ارثروبلاستي طبعا الاجابه السبيسر ده بيفيد طبعا في حالات الانفكشن بيسال بيقول هاو لونج داز ات تيك تو ري امبلانت عشان يعمل ريفيجن اند وات از ذا لاب ذات از نيدد ادري سبيشال واي ان ذيس كيس اتفضل حضرتك دكتور عبد الله تحب ترد طبعا ذيس از ا فيري يعني يعني هوت ايشو بس ذيس از نوت اور مين كونسيرن توداي بس هاويفر The main, the main rules for um, treating infections, first, you should get rid of any necrotic uh, tissue, uh, good debridement. Uh, uh, you should have five uh, deep cultures from different uh, uh, locations. And uh, you put the uh, spacer, and now you forget the fracture because now we are treating infected case. So if the bone is necrotic, you remove the bone. Don't think about reconstruction while you are doing debridement. You do debridement uh, as long as it takes, as long as it mandates. And then uh, if you do good debridement and you have a good antibiotic protocol, usually it takes six uh, weeks to three months to get rid from uh, infection. You should follow with the uh, parameters of international consensus uh, for uh, prosthetic joint infection of the Philadelphia meeting. Uh, you know that now they have major criteria and binary criteria, uh, and the, you can go for the literature to uh, see uh, the details about this. Uh, basically, uh, it's a combination of clinical uh, examination, uh, which is the uh, sinus discharge, or if there is a, a, a biological uh, 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 confirmation of the infection by uh, related uh, cultures and the use uh, and the good explanation of inflammatory markers. But uh, my uh, clear message of, for this question is that you should know, you should not uh, go to the second stage if you are not sure that you get rid from infection because you will make things more, uh, even more worse. Amen. <laughs> دكتور اسلام النوبي بيسال في حاله لو في لوزنج لوزنج ريبليسمنت تو ريبليس ذا سيمنت بروثيز وذ ا سيمنتد اور سيمنتلس وان بيسال بيقول في ريفيجن وانت افتكر انت تطرقت ليها في المحاضره في ريفيجن سيرجري ان ا سيمنت بروثيز تعمل سيمنتد ولا سيمنتلس ولا ابروتش ايه؟ اوكي دكتور اسلام 
situation in periprosthetic fracture is different from other revisions. You have a fracture and you have a loose implant. Cement is uh, one of the obstacles for the fracture because it is not easy uh, to uh, uh, remove the cement from the fracture end. It is, I know that you can use cemented implants, but technically it is very demanding. You should use impaction grafting at the fracture site from inside uh, by uh, uh, relevant instruments in order to close the fracture gaps before you cement. Uh, uh, as long as the cement is not coming from the fracture, you are successful. But if it is jammed in the fracture site, now you are endangering the uh, bone healing. So uh, uh, now the mainstay of treating Vancouver type B2 is doing a long stem lifestyle fixation cementless implant. Even if the original implant was cemented, you are going to remove the cement uh, by ultrasound if you have. Uh, I hope that we have this in Egypt, what's called the Oscar, or by some uh, uh, endofemoral approach, the osteotomy and uh, transfer osteotomy and the by gouges and the and the remove uh, uh, the bone cement. Uh, usually it is loose, but uh, try not to uh, go through the uh, cortex of the femur. It is very demanding surgery, but after you remove the cement, the beauty of long stem cementless implant that it is dependent on the diaphyseal fixation mainly. It is not dependent on the proximal bone stock. So your bruise and bruise stock will serve as soft tissue attachment only. So if you uh, have some more perforations while removing the cement, now if you bypass this defect by a suitable distance of the implant and you have a breast fit in the diaphysis, you are doing uh, uh, the job. Okay? Thank you. Uh, so I'll tell you, uh, of, uh, there is any role for minimally invasive approach technique and periprosthetic fractures? No. To my mind, it's, uh, if you have um, one, the only example for this, if you are going to uh, put um, a retrograde nail through the uh, a total knee uh, implant, which allows you to go through the central hole and you put a retrograde nail. But now this um, method is uh, questionable because the, the hole in the total knee uh, femoral component uh, will limit the size of your nail and then if you go with a uh, uh, thin uh, nail you will not get uh, enough stability for uh, fracture healing um, if you have a type c fracture which is well clear from the implant you can uh, put uh, the distal part of the fracture by mebo technique possibly but uh, in the proximal part you need uh, to have good exposure in order not to uh, endanger the surrounding uh, femoral artery, the sciatic nerve, while you are doing circulage wires of the uh, proximal uh, femur. So I don't recommend using uh, MIPO uh, technique in these difficult cases. And also, it may end by another fracture. For example, you have a periprosthetic fracture of the femur and you can you are going to plate it. Plate it. If you have a biological plating, if it is type C, Dr. Aydin, which is very well clear from the implant, you may uh, have a mebo technique in the uh, pure bone part, but when you are going to put screws in close relation to the uh, femoral stem, it is not easy to direct the screws with me with you. Amen. Akhir sual, huwa fi had biyul fi ahad al-ashaat al-zaradat bihan fi you used a circulage wire together with a locked stem. Is that a stable construct? Yani, madam, yes, it is. It is a stable construct because we are not depending on the circulage wire for regaining the uh, oh, rotational oh. alignment of the femur. We no, now the stem uh, lock the lock the stem. There lock the stem. The circulation wire only for reconstruction of the proximal bone stock for soft tissue uh, attachment and for fracture union. But we are depending on the diaphyseal fixation, so it is a stable. Uh,